good evening to uh, everyone online uh, first uh, let me thank uh, star hospitals and sipla group for giving me this opportunity to be with you all today evening for a brief discussion on the recent uh, guidelines that have come up in 2021 by european society of cardiology on heart failure so uh, this uh, this uh, group was headed by uh, mcdonald uh, is the chairman he is from united kingdom quite a lot of people all across europe and uh, singapore have taken part in uh, preparing this document there are several groups uh, which are also associated uh, with this uh, in preparing this document uh, because this is uh, one of the recent uh, guidelines that have come up on heart failure uh, let us briefly describe it i am given about uh, 20 minutes of time maybe i will slightly overshoot the time because uh, be, uh, that i need to give introduction as well as the treatment management of heart failure with reduced rejection fraction we all know there are four groups uh, this is uh, well known to all the cardiologists uh, uh, that uh, the class 1 is uh, uh, where it is recommended to give the treatment class 2a you should consider the treatment uh, class 2b being uh, you may or may not uh, be really giving or uh, prescribing that treatment and class 4 being class 3 being um, not recommending or uh, it's contraindicated level of evidence being if there are level of evidence a if there are multiple uh, if it is supported by multiple randomized trials level b being a single randomized trial level c is an expert opinion where the evidence uh, the level of evidence is quite low having said this uh, i'll start uh, briefly defining or uh, classifying the heart failure the heart failure is classified into different uh, phenotypes based on the ejection fraction having said this it is very important that uh, we see quite a lot of reports that the ejection fraction is most often by eyeballing we only see ejection fraction being measured by m mode putting two points at some point where you think you get 40 you put that parameters and write that number you see the importance of the whole treatment of heart failure is based on ejection fraction i want people who are doing echo to really concentrate and bring out a good ejection fraction report so you should make every attempt to do all the methods that are possible to bring out a ejection fraction including the m mode the volume the biplane if possible wherever there is a chance the 3d volume rendering methods to get a good ejection fraction if you are unable to get a good ejection fraction you can always support this by doing an mr to get an ejection fraction because the whole classification of heart failure is based on this so please do take time to get that number that is number 1 two the rationale behind this 40% as mildly reduced is based on the original treatment trials mm-hmm. in heart failure which have showed substantial improved outcomes in patients with less than 40% that is how this 40% has come so this is an evidence based 40% being a cut off point where there there is a significant improvement in outcomes if we give a guideline managed therapy the retrospective analysis of of heart failure fraction and preserved fraction included patients between uh, 41 and 49 have also sirap botika sirap botika jan nidra oshod mane with similar outcome i'm sorry uh, uh, can, uh, can somebody mute uh, all the other uh, uh, hello radiance team uh, can you please uh, all the other participants that's why this second group has come as heart failure with previously it used to be called as mid range ejection fraction this is a significant change by the yes. EU. they now call it as mildly reduced rejection fraction i uh, reiterate that these groups may also benefit with the treatment uh, that has been given for 
heart failure with rejection, reduced rejection fraction. They have an improved uh, outcomes regarding hospitalizations and CV deaths. The third group is the heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. Here, in all these groups, you should have cardinal signs and symptoms of heart failure. Be heart failure being a clinical syndrome, syndrome, you should look at the cardinal symptoms and signs. Cardinal symptoms being breathlessness, fatigue, fatal edema. So these are the cardinal symptoms. The cardinal signs being raised JVP, bilateral lung crackles, and ankle edema. So if you have these symptoms, ejection fraction is less than 40. They are grouped as heart failure with reduced rejection fraction. If you have these signs and symptoms, your rejection fraction is between 41 and 49. It is now called heart failure with mildly reduced rejection fraction. Previously, it used to be called as mid-range rejection fraction. This is a change in ESC 2021. The third group is heart failure with rejection fraction. Here, you should have cardinal signs and symptoms. EF should be 50, but there should be an objective evidence of diastolic dysfunction of the heart measured by ECO and also increased natriuretic peptides. So these are the three groups. Now, today I will uh, restrict my talk to heart failure with reduced rejection fraction. Uh, my colleagues will uh, discuss about the other two groups. Uh, the second uh, new change that has come out in ESC is it is not you say that uh, the ejection fraction is reduced. You, the, it is mandatory to make an etiological diagnosis of heart failure. So this is a new thing that has come out in heart failure. Just writing all patients as global hypokinesia, as dilated cardiomyopathy is no longer right. You should make an attempt to make an etiological diagnosis of heart failure. This I want to reiterate because we, most of the patients who come to our OP, we see an ECO and an ECG, the diagnosis being global hypokinesia, severe LV dysfunction as dilated cardiomyopathy. No, it's not right. So there are several causes of reduced LV function. Some of them you will make out because you are doing ECO. Some of them you should make an attempt to make a diagnosis. So CAD, this is one common thing that everyone, most of us will be interested in uh, diagnosing it. So a lot of people do make an attempt up to CAD and finish there. So we, this is one, I know that this is one of the most important causes of reduced rejection fraction, but you need to make assessment of others. The second is hypertension. So hypertension, you should always remember that there can always be a labile hypertension. So make an attempt to see whether you are uh, missing a hypertension to be a cause of heart failure. Also, if, uh, make uh, assessment to see for uh, labile causes of hypertension. Two is particularly unrecognized cause of heart failure. Look for renal artery stenosis. Well, uh, this is because we do echoes. Uh, we most often pick them up. Here also, I reiterate that a lot of times the echo is underperformed because we think that we do the value gradients and do an LV function, our echo is finished. So there are several parameters that have to be looked in. Echo is a very important parameter. I know that most of the cardiologists now are not very interested in echo, but most of the diagnosis of the cardiac diseases we can make on echo if you do a proper echo. So please do make a good attempt to do a good echo. The other important cause is erythemias. Tachyarrhythmias are one of the important uh, causes for heart failure. So whenever you see frequent ventricular ectopics, make an attempt to see what is the ectopic burden, particularly if the ectopic burden is more than 50% of in 24 hours, these can cause uh, uh, LV dysfunction. Remember that these are reversible causes of LV dysfunction. If you pick up, treat them, then you can always uh, make this patient better where the LV function can improve. Then the most common diagnosis being a lot of people make is uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Again, I reiterate that 
dilated cardiomyopathy you should make an attempt to do further investigations like a cardiac mr do a genetic testing to see whether there is a genetic marker for dilated cardiomyopathy the other causes of cardiomyopathy is being hypertrophic restrictive we all know then there is reversible causes like takotsubo syndrome peripartum cardiomyopathy um i also remember that alcohol can cause cardiomyopathy again this is one of the reversible causes make an attempt to see particularly young individuals heart failure make an attempt to see whether it is a uh, drug abuse uh, particularly metropolitan uh, cities cities you make an attempt to see for lot of people don't give this history so make sure that you see the elbows the thighs to see for uh, print pricks uh, or needle pricks where you can uh, suspect a uh, drug abuse again i say that these are some of the reversible causes so please do make an attempt to make a etiological diagnosis of reversible cardiomyopathy then congenital heart disease now it is most of the pediatric cardiologists do pick up this but uh, we should remember that there is also one of the causes for uh, reduced ejection fraction the other important things which i would like to highlight are uh, one is uh, viral myocarditis again the 50% of them reversible so you can uh, do an uh, cardiac mr or uh, micro endomyocardial biopsy to pick up some of these uh, we have seen a few cases of uh, hiv presenting as uh, cardiomyopathy severe aortic dysfunction so whenever there is a suspicion do make virologies or serology reports to see for hiv as a cause the other important we know that now it is uh, cancer chemotherapy there are several guidelines we should also make an attempt to see how to make out this uh, uh, drug induced cardiomyopathy particularly cancer induced cardiomyopathy at what stage to pick up when to start ac inhibitors are all have been described in this uh, guideline uh then this is one of the very important uh, things that are being uh, nowadays picked up that are infiltrative diseases uh the amyloid sarcoid tuberculosis again uh, the sarcoid uh, tuberculosis can be sometimes be if treated well can be reversible so make an attempt uh recently we have seen a case going around uh, uh, all over the state uh with a regular diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy but uh, uh, that patient had a, a concentric lvh so they are writing concentric lvh severe lvh dysfunction cardiomyopathy so we have done an echo uh, we could uh, do that uh, tissue doppler see apical sparing the suspected amyloid then we did a cardiac mr confirmed with uh, uh, abdominal fat pad biopsy it turned out to be amyloid so what my important is you should try to pick out an etiological cause don't just pick it on your own or you can come to cardiac cardiomyopathy because some of them are reversible really you can uh, have a very good prognosis in these individuals uh, then uh, some of the other causes being there can be a pericardial disease again uh, one uh, important uh, cause for uh, cardiomyopathy is uh, thymine deficiency please do me make an attempt to see for uh, thymine deficiency particularly in um, low socioeconomic group when you see lv dysfunction because giving thymine again the lv dysfunction is reversible neuromuscular dis- uh, diseases particularly they land up with uh, neurologists they come as a referral to us they never come to us directly but these are also some of the causes for lv dysfunction so what are the tests that are recommended just doing an ecg and echo and diagnosing as a heart failure is not right so i want you all to know what are the tests that can be done in these groups and uh, uh, how to go about from there the the uh, european society have given some guidelines they have classified this to be as a class 1 indication one is bnp and nt broker we know that uh, the cutoffs for uh, bnp is less than 35 and uh, nt pro bnp being less than 125 if you have the importance is if you have a bnp of less than 35 or ntp nt pro bnp less than 1.5 it has a negative predictive value of ruling out heart disease of 0.94 to 0.98 it is so important if you get it to be normal you can definitely say that the chance of heart failure is quite low having said that 
you should also know the conditions where they are falsely elevated or for their false low levels so a lot of patients uh, they get a bnp say everything is heart failure no so there are particularly the two groups where a lot of times they end up uh, getting a bnp and saying it is heart failure one is a sepsis and other is renal failure these groups by themselves uh, can have an elevated uh, bnps even without heart failure please do note this so getting a bnp in a renal failure to make a diagnosis of heart failure may not be right so the, you should also know where they are falsely elevated the other thing is in obese patients sometimes the bnp can be falsely low so you get a low level of bnp in a obese patient try to be very careful in ruling out a heart disease you should be careful about this the second important investigation that is class 1 is 12 lead ecg again i say a normal ecg the diagnosis of heart failure is very very unlikely so most of the patients with heart failure will have an abnormal ecg it can be in the form of lvh t wave inversion sinus tachycardia the two most important things which you need to look at particularly in heart failure which has bearing on treatment is qrs morphology and qrs width where you can with it can help us in devising the treatment plan particularly the devices so make a good reading of an ecg the third important this everyone of us will do a transthoracic echocardiogram I, as i also said just doing a cursory echocardiogram and reporting as an lv ejection fraction writing global hypokinesia doesn't finish an echocardiography lot of things can be picked on echocardiography you can probe it further make a further diagnosis for etiological cause to particularly this is more important in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where you should make an attempt to make all the diastolic indices to see whether we are dealing with a diastolic heart failure or not then chest x ray i should reiterate again that chest x ray still has a role because because a lot of times uh, cardiologists are not prescribing chest x ray because they think that the patient has a shortness of breath i have done an ecg and echo so i have a diagnosis of heart failure so there are two important things one is you will know the fluid overload in the lung by x ray alone your echocardiograph ecg doesn't show that number two the pulmonary causes can also be seen on uh, chest x ray for the, your cause of difficulty in breathing there can be a co existing disease please do a chest x ray in all patients this is class 1 indication according to esc then some of the routine blood tests they have said these are class 1 like your cbc urea electrolytes urea and creatinine electrolytes thyroid functions glucose and the hba1c then lipids you should also check the iron status because anemia could be contributory as well as worsen your heart failure so you have to do uh, transferrin saturation iron saturation studies and ferritin levels in all patients with heart failure these are class 1 indication these have to be done in all patients with heart failure then as i said i i should reiterate all patients with heart failure uh, heart failure with uh, decreased ejection fraction mri is a class 1 indication particularly in a group where your estimation of ejection fraction is inadequate if you have a poor window they say that if the endocardial border is not seen in two contiguous segments your estimation of ef is may turn out to be wrong that is why they most of the westerners they do the contrast echocardiography to accurately assess the ejection fraction so whenever you think your images are poor cardiac mri is a class 1 indication two as i already have said cardiac mri is a class 1 indication to characterize the myocardial disease it gives a lot of information on infiltrative diseases inflammatory diseases or uh, differentiating between myocarditis uh, then uh, your non compaction 
and uh, uh, infiltrative disorders like amyloid, sarcoid, hemochromatosis, they are all can be made on CMR. So if you cannot make an etiological diagnosis on ECO, like your valvular disease, you have a reduced rejection fraction, you think that coronaries are normal, then you should also look at cardiac MR, which is a class one indication. Then cardiac MR is also indicated in a case of dilated cardiomyopathy to distinguish between a ischemic and non-ischemic etiology. If you have a late gadolinium enhancement in subendocardial sub area, it could be ischemic or else it could be a non-ischemic. This is important to differentiate because you know that ischemic reduced LV ejection fraction, ICD may be an option and non-ischemic myocardial um, with uh, broadening QRS, CRT may be an option. Uh, so it is uh, wise to distinguish between an ischemic and non-ischemic myocardial damage. And their CMR is a class 2A indication. Then regarding coronary angiography, you know, a lot of uh, people do get a coronary angiography in, um, uh, with uh, LV dysfunction, but there are some indications where they, it is definitely necessary. Coronary angiography is recommended in patients with angina despite pharmacological therapy or symptomatic ventricular arrhythmia. So this is class one. So if you have angina, if you have symptomatic ventricular arrhythmia, invasive coronary angiogram is indicated in patients with LV dysfunction. Two, if the patient has a intermediate or high pretest probability of CAD and the presence of ischemia, non-invasive testing, this is a class 2B indication for invasive angiogram. So not all patients with LV dysfunction require an invasive angiogram, but these are the groups who will definitely require an invasive angiogram, particularly those with angina and symptomatic ventricular resistance. Then uh, CT coronary angiogram, if intermediate to high risk would require an invasive, low and intermediate risk or equivocal non-invasive stress test then you, you may uh, advise a CT coronary angiogram. This is a class two indication. Then non-invasive stress testing like uh, cardiac MR or a PET or stress echocardiography to assess the myocardial ischemia for candidates who are eligible for revascularization. So if you think the patient is eligible, you have to assess the viability with some form of non-invasive stress testing if it is positive, revascularization may help to improve the LV function. Again, this is a class 2B. This is now class 2A. Then uh, cardiopulmonary testing. This is particularly useful for advanced heart failures. I think uh, they will discuss in uh, further things. Uh, so coming to the management of patients with heart failure, this is a simple algorithm that has come out. I think Dr. Patnaik will also talk on this. Uh, but uh, to briefly describe this, all patients with reduced rejection fraction, the, the cornerstones of therapy used to be, the cornerstones of therapy are the triad of ACE inhibitors or ARNI, beta blocker, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. These should all patients require this unless there are intolerant or contraindication for these street drugs. To this, they have added the SGLT2 inhibitor, the dapagliflozin and ampagliflozin. So they, they say that all patients, now the ES is this, all patients would require, whether they're diabetic or not, should uh, dapagliflozin or ampagliflozin should be included in their treatment part. Uh, then those patients who have an ejection fraction of less than 35, QRS less than 130, may require an ICD, particularly if they're of ischemic etiology, as we know that ischemic or the ICD prevents more deaths than in non-ischemic. Non-ischemic will fall as uh, class 2A. Then patients in sinus rhythm, ejection fraction less than 35, QRS duration more than 130, CRTB may be indicated. I mean, to the uh, pharmacological treatment, there, as I said, the four classes of drugs are class one with level of evidence A being an ACE inhibitor. 
ACE inhibitor, we, this is the, one of the first drugs which have been used uh, in heart failure and which has shown uh, a mortality benefit. Uh, multiple trials have been uh, have shown the benefit, uh, including the consensus, save, solve, all have shown not only decreased hospitalization, but mortality benefit. So ACE inhibitor should be recommended to all patients with reduced rejection fraction. Uh, they, then the second uh, group is beta blocker. So there are uh, three beta blockers that have been shown to be very beneficial in uh, heart failure with reduced rejection fraction, which have shown a benefit in terms of uh, mortality as well as uh, heart failure hospitalizations. These are uh, metoprolol succinate. It is not metoprolol tartrate, but metoprolol succinate. That is your uh, metoprolol extended release preparations. So in uh, merit heart failure trial, they have shown to have a benefit in uh, heart failure with uh, re reduced rejection fraction in improving mortality. The second uh, beta blocker that has been shown to be useful is uh, bisoprolol. So the CARBIS trial has similarly shown a significant benefit about 25% reduction in heart failure and uh, CV outcomes with uh, bisoprolol. The third beta blocker that has been shown to be benefit in heart failure is carvedlol. This has been most extensively studied. The US uh, carvedlol study uh, and uh, several others have shown uh, benefit. So these are the three beta blockers which are useful. Any beta blocker cannot be recommended because the trials and evidence shows that these are the three beta blockers which are useful in heart failure. Then uh, coming to mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, the two mineralocorticoid antagonists after the real style and the emphasis and ephesis uh, studies uh, have shown to improve mortality and uh, uh, heart failure hospitalizations. So they are also class one recommendation. The, uh, the recent interest is with the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, the DAPA heart failure trial, uh, where uh, the uh, DAPA glyphosate given at uh, 10 milligrams in patients with EF less than 40, NYHA class uh, two to class three, increased anti-pro BNP and EGF are more than 30 have shown a 26% reduction in uh, primary endpoints. It has also shown improvement in all-cause mortality, quality of life, symptom improvement, and uh, improved physical function. So then the emperor reduced trial uh, similarly has shown a 25% reduction in composite endpoint of CV mortality and hospitalization. So now dapagliflozin and empagliflozin are recommended for patients with heart failure to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and death this is class 1 and level of evidence being a so these four groups will be required for all patients of reduced rejection fraction unless they are contraindicated or they are not tolerated then the uh, the one group that has scored over others is the army the sacubitrol valsartan combination. Uh, uh, as you know, the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial is one of the landmark trials in the last decade. It, the uh, uh, sacubitrol valsartan was shown to be superior to enlapril in reducing It seems we have lost you, sir. Uh, you have muted yourself, Raju. You have, un you have to unmute. Please. You are able to listen now? Yeah, yeah now we can. Yeah, yes. now, okay, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial uh, is uh, one of the landmark trials in the last decade. So this is one of the superiority trial. Most of them, they show it to be non-inferior. This is a superiority trial. So ANI is uh, 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 shown to be superior to enlapril in decreasing hospitalization, CV mortality, and all-cause mortality in ambulatory patients with heart failure with reduced rejection fraction. It has also been shown to improve symptoms, quality of life, reduction in incidence of diabetes requiring insulin treatment, and reduction in decline in GFR. So it also reduced the requirement of diuretic dosages. 
However, it is not, uh, there is an increased incidence of hypotension with the RNA. You, know, you should be careful when you start uh, RNA. Uh, the, but uh, a lot of patients do tolerate it well. We have seen a lot of uh, improvement with uh, RNA. There are also new two studies which have shown that initiation of RNA in hospitalized patients who are uh, ACE naive have also shown you know, reduced uh, CV death and hospitalization by 42% when compared to uh, enlapril. That is why now sacubitral valsartan is recommended as a replacement for ACE inhibitor in patients with reduced heart failure to reduce the risk of uh, heart failure, hospitalizations and death. Particularly when you are uh, changing from ACE to uh, sacubitral valsartan, then you need a 36 hour uh, washout period. Able to move my slides. Um, can someone help? I am unable to move my slides. Yeah, yeah. Now it's moving, sir. It's moving, sir. Now it has moved. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The second important uh, stress I want to make out is whenever you're treating heart failure, don't just stop by writing drugs. So a lot of times we see prescriptions with underdosage. So if you want to have maximum benefit, you should take the dosage of drugs to maximum tolerable dose, particularly the target dose that have been used in trials. So to say some of them, you know, most common ACE inhibitors being enlapril and ramipril that are being in use, used in India. Enlapril, you should go up to 10 to 20 milligrams twice daily. That is up to 40 milligram a day. Then ramipril, it is 5 milligram twice daily. That is 10 milligrams a day. These are the dosages that have been used in uh, trials. Then sacubitral valsartan, you can go up to 200 milligram twice daily. That is the maximum dose that has the maximum benefit. Bisoprolol, then the maximum dosage is 10 milligrams. So we do see a lot of uh, prescriptions with 2.5, uh, maximum of 5. So if patient is tolerating, go to the maximum dose. Carvidolol, maximum dose is 25 milligrams twice daily. Metoprolol, succinate, 200 milligrams once daily. But I don't know, a lot of patients do not tolerate that. Then uh, about a quick word about uh, MRA, spinolactone, we see a lot of times being used at 25 milligram twice daily. Usually spinolactone in all the studies have been given once a day. The maximum tolerated spinolactone dose in the studies is uh, 50 milligram. To have an optimal dose, you want to give spinolactone, give spinolactone 50 milligram OD in patients with heart failure. With the caution being, check for uh, renal failure and hyperkalemia in patients uh, taking spinal lactone. Then dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Those studies have shown 10 milligrams of dapagliflozin. Empagliflozin, you can go up to 25, but for heart failure, 10 milligrams is what has been studied. Then a quick word about ARBs. The three ARBs that have been used in heart failure are candisartan, losartan, valsartan. Please remember, these are the three ARBs that have been studied in heart failure. So, hello? So, don't keep candisartan uh, for heart failure. So, if at all we were to do an evidence-based study, if at all you are using an ARB for heart failure, use these three which have been studied, either valsartan, losartan, or candisartan. Candisartan by uh, charm trial, losartan, life, valsartan, well have trial. So you should also know the maximum doses of this. Okay. Then the other two drugs that have been uh, also used in heart failure are digoxin, uh, maximum dose of 0.25 per day. Hydrolysine isosorbitate dinitrate. Now, there are a lot of people who are prescribing. So, the maximum dose is two tablets TAD. The uh, starting dose is one tablet TAD. The, it has hydrolysine of 37.5 and uh, isosorbitate dinitrate of 20. So, the other classes of drugs that are being in, used in heart failure, other than those 
four drugs acrb arni beta blocker mra and uh, sglt2 are diuretics so diuretics are recommended in patients with heart failure with signs and symptoms of congestion to elevate heart failure and improve exercise is a class 1 so particularly combination of uh, the uh, loop diuretics with thiazides have shown to have a significant improvement uh, in uh, heart failure hospitalizations so there is this is uh, particularly in patients uh, with uh, congested lungs loop diuretics with thiazides may be a class 1 indication so they should be given at a dose uh the uh, minimal dose to make the patient you you only make that is the target for uh, using these diuretics then i said arb is still uh, being used uh particularly in patients who are uh, not tolerating as or arni if you are using arb use either candesartan valsartan or losartan then uh, ivabradin we all know the ivabradin acts on the fast current of sinus node uh, pacemaker current of sinus node thereby uh, decreasing the diastolic depolarization and reducing the heart rate so ivabradin uh, in the uh, shift trial have shown to be beneficial ivabradin should be considered in symptomatic patient with ef of less than 35 in sinus rhythm who have a resting heart rate of 70 despite treatment with uh, evidence based doses of beta blockers this is a class 2a so even after your beta blocker maximum tolerated dose if your heart rate is higher than 70 patient is in sinus rhythm ef less than 35 you should consider giving him an ivabradin to reduce the heart rate to below 70 this is a class 2 recommendation with a single uh, trial of shift then two is uh, those patients uh, who are who have contraindication to beta blocker these patients should also receive ivabradin to reduce the heart rate then there you know there is a recent uh, drug that has come out that is very secret which is a soluble uh, gonlet cyclase receptor uh, stimulator uh, basically it binds to uh, to a site different from uh, nitric oxide stimulates the gonlet cyclase synthesizes the gonlet cyclase uh, to nitric oxide that is how this verisigat acts so verisigat may be considered in patients with uh, class 2 to class 4 who have worsening heart failure despite treatment with uh, ES inhibitor beta blocker and mra this has been shown in victoria study to reduce cv mortality and heart failure two uh, important uh, side effects of uh, this uh, versigat is uh, one is uh, uh, decreased red cell count so you keep a watch on uh, red cell count second is uh, as with any vasodilator it has a side effect of uh, hypotension and syncope so this is still not available but uh, this is one drug that has come out of late then now uh, a lot of us uh, are uh, i have already started using uh, hydrolyzin isosorbitrate dinitrate for a long time now so this is indicated in uh, patients with ef of less than 35 uh, uh with nyh class 3 or class 4 uh, who are already taking as beta blocker or M- uh, mra and still symptomatic so this group you can add an uh, hydrolyzin isosorbitrate dinitrate then for uh, patients who are uh, not tolerating as arb arni you can also give uh, isosorbitrate uh, and hydrolyzin combination as a vasodilator this is a class 2b indication finally a quick word of uh, digoxin so digoxin may be considered in symptomatic heart, heart failure with reduced digoxin fraction in sinus rhythm despite treatment with ac inhibitor beta blocker or mra to reduce the risk of hospitalization it has no effect on the mortality but for a symptomatic benefit to reduce rehospitalization digoxin may be considered in patients who are all, already using the triad of uh, heart failure guideline directed management and patients in sinus rhythm in patients with atrial fibrillation digoxin have not shown to be benefit 
there is also a concern of increased mortality in a group with atrial fibrillation so digoxin in atrial fibrillation still uh, not to be used or better to be avoided or uh, uh, so, so that is the reason why digoxin should be considered in patients with heart failure with in sinus rhythm so this uh, i think uh, uh, dr patnaik will talk about the algorithms uh, when because of short of time i'll skip that slide then finally about a quick word about uh, icds so we know the reason why icds are uh, used so the the high proportion of no, proportion of deaths in patients with heart failure uh, even in patients who have a mild symptoms occur suddenly and unexpectedly many of these are thought to be because of uh, electrical disturbances uh, including ventricular tachycardias bradyarrhythmias or systole so compared to imidacloprid uh, icds were known to reduce mortality in survivors of cardiac arrest and in patients who experience unsustained ventricular arrhythmia that is why for uh, secondary prevention icd is recommended to reduce the risk of sudden death or all cause mortality in patients who have recovered from ventricular arrhythmia who are expected to live survive for more than one year only then uh, the you should recommend an icd for secondary prevention so for primary prevention uh, icd is recommended to reduce the risk of sudden death and all cause mortality in symptomatic patients of ischemic etiology so uh, the difference is in danish trial the rates of sudden deaths in non ischemic cardiomyopathies were quite low there were only 70 out of 1116 patients who had died suddenly over a five year period uh, in non ischemic cardiomyopathy while there was a modest decrease in sudden death with icd this did not statistically improve overall mortality on the other hand ischemic heart disease patients are at a greater risk of sudden cardiac death compared to non ischemic cardiomyopathy so the absolute risk reduction with icd is greater in ischemic cardiomyopathy that is why an icd is recommended to reduce the risk of sudden death and all cause mortality in patients with symptomatic heart failure of ischemic etiology and an lv ef of less than 30% with optimal medical therapy for more than 3 months who are expected to survive one year what we need to remember is nwha class 2 to 3 ef less than 30% and uh, on adequate medical therapy ischemic cardiomyopathy icd is indicated for primary prevention for secondary prevention for uh, non ischemic cardiomyopathy uh this is uh, a class 2a indication so ischemic cardiomyopathy you can go ahead and uh, prescribe an icd for a non ischemic etiology you should always uh, discuss with the patients and uh, then consider for icd uh then variable icd is a quick word wearable icd is compared to transvenous they have similar outcomes only thing the two disadvantages are it cannot pace or it is uh, it cannot give an anti tachycardia uh, protocols or anti tachycardia therapies the third is there is a slightly increased incidence of inappropriate shocks so wearable icd is may be considered in patients who have heart failure who are at risk of sudden cardiac death for a limited period or as a bridge to implanted device before that you can use the wearable icd this is a class 2b indication quick word about crt we all know crt is useful in patients with uh, lbbb morphology particularly with uh, qrs duration of more than 150 it is a class 1 indication 
uh, between 139 and 149 it is also a, uh, with you know, lbbb morphology it is a class 1 but the level of evidence is being uh, you know, level of evidence is b then non lbbb morphology more than uh, 150 milliseconds uh, you should uh, consider crt which is a class 2a indication uh, so two groups which are uh, beneficial one group which is definitely beneficial is uh, lbbb more than 150 second is between 130 and 149 you can still advise uh, on uh, crt for these groups of patients particularly if they are symptomatic non lbbb more than 150 you can identify a group where you can uh, advise or crt so the other important uh, area where crt should be considered is crt rather than rv pacing is recommended for patients with heart failure with reduced rejection fraction regardless of nv nyha class and qrh width who have an indication for ventricular pacing for I degree AV block. So patients who are going for, who have a heart failure, <coughs> reduced rejection fraction, who have a high degree AV block going for pacing, CRT is better than an RV pacing, which is a class 1A indication for CRT. Well, can you summarize? I think uh, we're getting... I, I, this is the last slide, sir. I'm finished. Uh, any questions? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think we'll take all the questions at the end of the three presentations. Okay. okay. Because uh, many of them are uh, interlinked. The talks are interlinked. So now I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Naveen to talk about uh, management of heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Naveen, are you, are you on board? Uh, Raju, you, you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah, you can stop stop sharing your screen. Okay, Naveen. Yes, good evening. Yeah, yeah, good evening. You can uh, start off your talk. You can you can start sharing your screen. Yeah. So basically, so basically Raju, Raju, Raju has spoken uh, mostly about, mostly about failure, failure with, uh, with uh, reduced, reduced rejection fraction, fraction uh, uh, less than 40% D. 